Good morning. This is the second public uh, session for our budget, and we are so glad that you're here this morning. Um, if you have not been to these budget hearings uh, before, the way we conduct them is we listen to you. The budget has been uh, put out by the city manager and then the mayor commented, and this year they pretty much agreed with the uh, uh, way the budget was con constructed. Part of the reason for that is that this is the year of pension reform, so a lot of our discretionary funding uh, is not available. So we have really tried to uh, budget the things that are the most important to our residents, and we hope that you agree with that. We are going to be listening to you, and then after all of the residents have spoken, each of the council members will get a chance to uh, make some comments, and then the mayor will wrap it up. Um, I want to just inform you of uh, there is a, a proposed change to our city charter that will be on the ballot in April that will kind of uh, turn our budget process uh, a little bit to 90 degrees. We'll be having more of these types of meetings in the fall as we're setting our city priorities. So we'll be able to hear from you as we develop our council priorities. Uh, we'll have these public meetings. Then the city manager will work on a budget that reflects those priorities. So really the time for input will be in the fall, which we feel will be a much more meaningful way to get your uh, input on the budget. When the budget's prepared, we don't have a lot of wiggle room. So although we'd love to hear from you, there's not a whole lot of money that we can move around. So we really think that's a good charter change. So if you agree, we hope that that will be adopted in April uh, with some other ballot changes. We've done a lot of different ways to try to get our residents engaged in the budget process. Uh, the mayor and the city manager and the department heads had a, a Twitter chat that I think was uh, uh, very well received by folks who are on Twitter. Then we also have KC Momentum those of you who are uh, used to using the internet can go on KC Momentum and uh, register some of your priorities for the budget. So we're really trying to reach out to as many people in as many different ways uh, as possible. Uh, the staff has also asked me to uh, mention that the Community Engagement University, there are flyers about that at the sign-in table. And you can sign up for that. It's another way to uh, help our citizens be more engaged in the in the process of city hall. So, uh, I will introduce myself, and we'll e introduce ourselves uh, just beforehand, and then we will wait to comment after you have made uh, your remarks. I'm Jan Markison, and I am the councilwoman from the fourth council district and the chair of the finance, governance, and ethics committee. And we'll start down at the end with the city manager. Troy Schulte, City Manager. Michael Brooks, 5th District, 5th District City Council. I'm John Sharp from the 6th District, member of the Finance Committee. I'm Melba Curls. I represent the 3rd District at large. Scott Taylor, 6th District at large. Uh, Sly James, Mayor. Dick Davis, 1st District. Cindy Sterko, Mayor Pro Tem, 5th District at large. Ed Ford, 2nd District at large. Scott Wagner from the 1st District at large. Jim Glover from the 4th District at large. And uh, Travis Levitt is our timekeeper. We'll ask if you hold your comments to three minutes, if possible. And he will let you know ap after your first two minutes are up, and then he will give you a time. So we'll just uh, kind of keep things moving. OK, the first, and uh, Russ Johnson is at the Country Club right away meeting for our streetcar extension, so he could not be here. Our first uh, speaker is Linda Callen. If you, could, if you could give me your name and your affiliation and address, that would be helpful. Good morning, I'm Linda Callen. I'm the director of the West Side Can Center. The address is 2130 Jefferson. And of course, as we all know, the West Side is the best side. Thank you for supporting the Can Center, specifically the West Side Can Center. Healthy neighborhoods need healthy people living with them, and we appreciate your continued support of our primary caregiver, which is Truman Medical Center. Even with uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, a lot of our people in the neighborhood will not be covered by insurance. And by default, Truman Medical Center gets to be our primary caregiver. 
partners in our success in the West Side's metamorphosis has been Parks and Rec, neighborhoods and the neighborhood programs of Parks and Rec, and over the last two years, specifically dangerous buildings. I love a man with a bulldozer. Another of our support agencies is Legal Aid of Western Missouri. Together we have litigated to address many blighted properties in our neighborhood and we're, now we're working on making sure that no more properties fall into disrepair or languish due to family inheritance disputes. Um, I know that Legal Aid had requested some funding for a position to help with continuing that momentum on beneficiary aids and as we're an aging society and we have a lot of people that don't understand the legal ramifications and as one of my senior citizens said let the kids work it out and we know how well that works uh, so if you would reconsider funding at least a position to deal with the beneficiary deeds and I know we're not the only neighborhood that's dealing with aging in place issues um, I may have misunderstood uh, that perhaps we will be losing six neighborhood positions and neighborhood preservation. And I believe this is a slip, slippery slope and this is one of the reasons we got to the mess that we're in today with thousands of unkept properties and rotting structures because we kept raiding and decimating the neighborhood preservation department. And I wish you would consider reinstating those positions. They've been an invaluable, immeasurably invaluable partner in us being able to revitalize our West Side neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to address you with our concerns and appreciation. Thanks, Linda. Heather Laird. Morning. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Heather Laird. I'm a casting director here in Kansas City. And I'm here to speak on behalf of a volunteer organization called the Film Commission of Greater Kansas City. Um, on behalf of the film and production community here, I want to thank you for putting the Film Commission into the budget. I would just like to speak for a few short minutes um, about the economic impact of production here in Kansas City. In the 10 years since the old office was closed, um, the job of the film commissioner here has changed really dramatically. It's no longer just about filmmaking. Um, that's not to say that we don't have a vibrant independent community of, of independent filmmakers here in Kansas City. We most certainly do. And there are a number of them uh, represented here today to, to stand here on behalf of the reestablishment of the film office. But the fact remains, in 2012, more than 120 million uh, was spent on production in Kansas City and the vast majority of that was actually not on film production but rather commercial and print advertising, uh, corporate industrial internet and TV show production. This is a growing industry and the new business is to be found in attracting new production to Kansas City. Um, for, and, and the truth is for the last 10 years we haven't had anybody doing that here in Kansas City. Kansas City has really been behind the eight ball in this regard. Two quick examples. Um, this last year we lost a $12 million feature film to the city of Atlanta. Now this was a movie that was about our city and not only that but at that time we had a state tax credit that was competitive to Georgia but we didn't have a film commissioner here to answer the call when when they re, you know and to to try and sell it to them and so they didn't shoot their movie here America's Got Talent was interested in shooting in Kansas City this past year and a production like that can spend upwards of 500,000 in a week in your community on crew uh, hotels uh, restaurants grocery stores but we lost America's Got Talent to another city Right there, and those are, those are um, projects that we know of, that we lost. That's $12.5 million in production that didn't come here because we didn't have a film commissioner here 
to uh, adequately market Kansas City, and we didn't have a film commissioner qualified to close the deal when they called. And my last point is that we lost all that free advertising. You know, when a show like America's Got Talent comes into your community, they shoot the auditions, and then they shoot B-roll of your city. And then when the TV show airs, you've got a one-hour-long commercial about your city that's viewed by tens of millions of viewers. And in we, we didn't get that. So anyway, that's why putting the Film Commission back in Kansas City is so important, and that's why we want to thank you for doing it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jeff Burroughs Scanlon. Thank you very much. My name is Jeff Burroughs Scanlon. I live in the uh, Battle Flood Heights neighborhood, which is part of the Marlboro Coalition. And uh, for the la um, last 20 years, I've been involved in film and film festivals. I'm an actor and a writer um, in the Kansas City area. And I am here to uh, speak to all three of the line items uh, dealing with arts and film. The Office of Culture and Cl Cultural and Creative Services, the Arts KC Fund, and the Kansas City Film Commission. And um, some of the stuff I've been involved in in my own neighborhood, the Marlboro Coalition uh, recently got a Catalyst grant, and I was on the Arts Committee there, and they are very interested, we are very interested, in uh, bringing arts to our community, to uh, what we think of as the southeast corner of the city center. Um, and, and there's very little there, and there's a lot of, of opportunity. Um, in regard specifically to the Film Commission, and to give a little historical background, many of you were here around in the city, many of you may not have been, uh, to some of the stuff that Heather just shared. Um, I've, I've been in touch in the last couple of days with uh, Patty Broyles Harper, formerly Patty Watkins. She was the Film Commissioner here. And uh, one of the things she shared with me was that while she was here, the Missouri Economic Development Corporation stated that their statistics and studies showed that for every $1 budgeted to the Kansas City Film Commission by, the Can by Kansas City, Missouri, there was a return of $125 directly into the Kansas City metro economy. That's phenomenal. You know, show me where else that happens. Um, and uh, her vision for this again is certainly different than it used to be. She will be the first one to admit that there was a booming economic, uh, economy at the time and there was a perfect storm of filmmaking at the time when she was here and brought lots of wonderful production here. But now we have to have, as Heather referred to, we have to have somebody to answer the phone. We have to have a start. We have to have something here. Um, film commissioners across the continent have spoiled the industry with good customer service and quick replies to calls and questions, and we don't have that. Um, but uh, this will continue to bring both monies and jobs to the area if we have a dedicated employee or employees and a dedicated budget. Lastly, I would just like everyone who is in support of these three items, the Office and Cultural and Creative Services, the Arts KC Fund, and the Kansas City Film Commission, who is here, please stand up. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Larry Garrett. Well, he stole my clothes, just for starters, so. Uh, my name is Larry Garrett, 4th District, live near um, the Nelson, the Southmoreland Park, where the Shakespeare Festival happens, the Kemper. So I'm kind of in the middle of everything that's art related, but specifically, I'm also on the uh, Greater Kansas City Film Commission and serve on the Missouri Arts Council. Um, I just want to pick up, Heather did a great job of talking about the need for it. I want to pick up on a couple of themes that she had. Number one, when we talk about filmmaking, we're talking about production. When we say production, it's kind of like if you brought a, a plant here, there's going to be a production line. Production line means that shoots are going out and they're buying food. They're hiring talent, they're hiring crew, they're renting gear. Uh, they're staying in hotel rooms if it's an out-of-town shoot. So there is a lot of economic uh, development, a lot of economic support that happens around any kind of a production. Number two, it is way more than filmmaking. Um, 
we were very successful 10, 12 years ago in attracting major movies like the Ang Lee film Ride with the Devil, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. That's unlikely to happen on that same scale. But what's changed is there's so many more kinds of production happening. So there's webisodes, there are TV shows that are now traveling around the country like American Idol, uh, who are more likely to come into markets like this and do the same kind of spending that the major films did. Uh, last point, very simple. Out of the top 40 cities in the United States, of which Kansas City, I think, currently is number 37, there are only four that do not have an in-city uh, film commission. Two of those, Portland and Oklahoma City, actually have the state film commission headquartered in their town. So it's not like they're lacking for a way to access that city. The only other two in that top 40 are St. Louis and Kansas City. St. Louis does not have a currently, as I know, a film office. At least if you go online, they say, go talk to the state. At least in Kansas City, we've had volunteers that have maintained the film commission since the film office itself went out of business a few years ago. And I think that goes to the uh, positive need and the strength of the city in wanting to support filmmaking, production, and every aspect of that. So. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Larry. Okay, Siobhan McLaughlin Leslie. Good morning. I'm Siobhan McLaughlin Leslie, a 30 year resident of Kansas City, and for the last 25 years, I've lived at 6037 McGee Street. So I consider myself a Kansas Cityan. I'm also on the board of Art, the Arts KC Regional Council. And today I'd like to talk to you about the three bu budget items, arts the Arts Convergence Plan that's, that's being proposed. 198.5 for the Office of Cultural and Creative Services, 75 for the Arts KC Fund, and 50,000 for the Kansas City Film Commission. My appeal is both economic and emotional, so double E if you remember anything from today. Economically, the amount we're asking for, or that's in the budget, $325,000, is really small in comparison to the economic impact of arts and culture in our region. Notably, it's $273 million attributed to nonprofit arts and culture. So when you look at 60% of those amenities in Kansas City, Missouri alone, that's $164 million. So small in comparison. Secondly, there are over 19,000 people employed in nonprofit creative industries in Kansas City, Missouri alone, supporting businesses like galleries, writers, artists, etc. And these workers and businesses in Kansas City generate 2.8 billion in revenues annually and 1.41 billion in revenues that go out to the region around us. So if for nothing else, please invest in our economy. But also please invest in our future as a city, and that's my emotional appeal. My daughter, Keenan, um, and when she was in high school, was a member of a group called Common Ground. And it really um, supported diversity and diverse lifestyles, diverse points of views in her high school. She's founded that club at Emory University. Why do I have a kid so committed to diversity? I owe it to the arts. Actually, I owe it to the Coterie Theater. I took her and her sister to see the Watsons go to Birmingham. The chatter in the back of the car on the way home was, how could somebody ever do something like that to another human being? My older daughter, Keenan, said, Olivia, that's just fiction. Teachable moment. I said, no, 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 ladies. I am ashamed to say that, yes, this does happen. It has happened in our past, and it happens now. I owe her perspective and her commitment to diversity to the arts. So please, now is the time to invest in the arts in our city. Please do that. And I'd like everybody here today who supports the three line items to please stand with me, just in case you didn't see us all before. <laughs> Thank you for your consideration. Great. Thank you. Brian Manigan. Hello, I'm Brian Mangan. I own my own production company, Mangan Productions. Thank you for all for being here on a Saturday. Um, I've had my production company for 23 years. My wife and I started a company called Exposure Model and Talent 19 years ago, along with Sean Mullane, that's here too. 
And you can see the, the compassion that we have for the film industry here. What I do in Kansas City is a production designer, art, art director, and do a lot of location scouting. I'm also with the, uh, the Kansas City, Greater Kansas City Film Commission, and I do the locations for that. And I, I'm out there selling this city when stuff comes in from directors or from production companies. I'm out selling this beautiful town from the old to the new to the cost factor of all this. And what I urge you guys to do is, you know, get somebody into the office so that individuals like myself, we just have this little tiny area. We need to be represented out into the big community. And one of them it was the uh, movie that came in, it was $3 million called Last Will. Well, they came into town, they had five other cities to look at but they chose Kansas City because I kept pressuring them to say, here's what we have, this is, this is the crew. We have over 250 people that rely on this, not only the talent agencies. So we just urge you guys to uh, get this passed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bill, Bill Drummond. Bill. <laughs> everybody. Uh, maybe we should cut this short and, and just quit talking about arts in general, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is an example of art from a man who moved here from Texas. He moved here to Kansas City because of the quality of life, the affordable uh, cost of living, and he also moved here because we had a self-aware community of creatives. And I think Mike Burke and the Mayor's Commission has very adequately shown that we have something here that other United States cities do not have on the scale or the effective uh, possibility that we have here in Kansas City. So what you're hearing repeatedly is let's put money in to the arts and the development of arts as an economic development tool. If you were to measure the result of what the money goes in and what comes out, uh, investing in culture and the creative um, side of our city probably has a yield, and I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say equal to, if not greater than, conventional incentives. So if we're talking about economic development, PIEA, TIF, all those acronyms out there. Investing in the arts has a better chance of paying back and will probably have a greater long-term impact for our whole city than all the alphabet soups of incentives that we currently are using. I'm not saying throw away the incentives. I'm saying think of the arts as an economic development and go for this. This is our time here. We're in, a, we're in an economic point in the United States right now that a little money can go a long ways. And if we're talking about discretionary funding, I can assure you that the cost of one freeway on-ramp would more than adequately fund everything that we're talking about. So I would just like to put this into perspective that when you're making decisions about how much money goes into infrastructure repair and, and improvements and airport and whatever else we're talking about, let's talk about the human infrastructure here. And that leads me into my second topic, which is I believe that we should fully fund, perhaps increase funding for the health department. The only thing standing be between us in a major, major disaster of a catastrophic nature is the health department. One flu epidemic will do more damage to this city than most any other cat catastrophe I can imagine. So I want to see the health department fully funded and perhaps enhanced with funding. Third thing, homesteading for the artist. I'll be brief. This is an example, boy, it's a long list. This is an example of the homes that are available in my area right now, they're on what's called the homesteading authority list. And I would like to ask you all to advocate for putting creatives in these homes as an intention, 
as a economic development intention. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Hey, Linda Williams. My name is Linda Williams. I'm with the Just Off Broadway Theater at 3051 Central. Um, and I'm really just here in support of the three line items that uh, are wrapped around the arts community. Uh, arts opportunities in the inner city is vital to connecting the inner city community for exposure, uh, and support of our youth organizations and our actors and our performers. So offices such as the Film Commission, the Arts KC Fund are critical to supporting the arts and, and the core of Kansas City. So we're just here really to add our support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perhaps a new topic, Ron McClendon. Where's Ron, there he is. Good morning, my name is Ron McClendon. I'm here on behalf of the uh, Transit Action Network and I wanna talk about transit. I have three brief topics. One is funding, another is crowding, and the third is snow. Uh, over the past year or so, in response to concerns that we raised a year ago in these budget hearings, there's been a lot of progress made between the City of Kansas City and the Council and the Area, uh, Kansas City Area Transportation Authority. As a result, uh, there's a whole lot more budget certainty right now for public transit. The ATA has a much better idea of how much money it's going to have to work with in the upcoming, transit, upcoming budget year. Uh, still, the City of Kansas City is not paying the full cost of the transit service that it is purchasing from the ATA on behalf of its citizens. I checked with Michael Graham, uh, the ATA's finance director, just yesterday, and his estimate is that during this calendar year, the ATA will have to draw, draw down from its reserve account three to four million dollars to keep the current transit service operating. That's a, a situation which is not sustainable. I know you know it's not sustainable, but I think it's, it's important that we bring this to your attention every year. Second, uh, second item I wanna talk about is crowding and particularly crowding on buses. Uh, as you might guess, uh, transits, the level of transit service on Saturdays is less than it is on weekdays. The level of transit service on Sundays is less than on, on Saturdays. My personal transit experience on Sundays is mostly on Main Street Max, although I do ride many other routes during the course of my uh, week. Um, my experience is that on Sundays, Max on Main Street is unusually late more often than not. The buses are scheduled to run every 30 minutes and they, are, they often run with, with standing room only. There are only three Max buses on Sundays uh, there's a great need to up that to five buses so we can have 15 minute service at least between downtown and the plaza. That's gonna cost more. I don't know if you'll take it out of the city budget or describe to the ATA how they can cut some other service to make that possible. My third topic is snow, specifically snow management. Uh, I know that's a, that's a concern every year for everybody Everybody wants to get the streets cleared as quickly as possible. The problem is that the city's snow management practice is to clear the driving lanes of our streets without regard for the walking lanes of our streets. And specifically, city snow plows manage, uh, remove snow by transferring it from the driving lanes onto the walking lanes. So I'd just like to ask you to give more consideration to people who are not driving uh, during times of snow. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ron. Okay, Kathy Knotts. Oh, 
morning. Good morning. I'm Kathy Knotts with Truman Medical Center's 2301 Holmes. I want to thank every one of you for your leadership and for, I also want to thank the voters of Kansas City for affirming city support for Truman Medical Centers and the other safety net providers through the health levy. Um, as you know, Truman Medical Centers takes pride in its outside of the bed approach to health care. Um, we are doing this through our healthy harvest produce markets, our mobile market that goes to grocery underserved areas in our city, and also our plans for an affordable community grocery store um, in a food desert at the edge of downtown at 27th and Troost. Uh, in addition to prov providing acute, primary, and emergency care services, regardless of a resident's ability to pay, we are also the city's uh, trauma center, number one acute care trauma center. And TMC is a vital partner in addressing the council adopted priorities with the city's safety departments, police, fire, um, ambulance services, and with the health department, as well as the collaborative efforts the city is undertaking to reduce violence. The proposed budget requires a 2% cut to Truman Medical Centers and the other safety net providers, and it is our hope that you will reconsider that cut and look at flat funding for the safety net providers for the adopted budget. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Okay, Paul Kim. Morning. Marcus and it's nice to see, Ms. Marcus and it's nice to see you. I know it's been a while. My name is Paul Kim, and uh, back to the old topic of uh, films in Kansas City. I've been an actor for 23 years. Uh, since 1997, I've been with Exposure, the company founded by uh, Mr. Brian Mangan and his wife Jen and his wife Jennifer. Um, I'd like to read a list to you of something. Four four Hunger Games movies. The third one is going to be made into two parts. Lila and Eve, starring Jennifer Lopez, Halt and Catch Fire for AMC TV, Five Seasons of The Walking Dead, The Originals, Term Life with Vince Vaughn, Rectify on the Sundance Channel, and Cell, a movie based on a Stephen King novel starring Samuel L. Jackson and John Cusack. Those are all being filmed in Atlanta. There's no reason why we couldn't get those movies here. I was a uh, sent last minute to St. Louis uh, to appear in the George Clooney movie, Up in the Air. Uh, while I was there, I asked one of the film crew, what part of Los Angeles are you from? That film crew member told me, we're not, part, we're not from Los Angeles. When the company came to St. Louis, they hired every video production company in St. Louis to work on the movie, every video production company. At my, dot, my uh, goddaughter's graduation party, I met a woman who coordinated all of the hotel stays for George Clooney, Anna Kendrick, Vera Farmiga, Jason Bateman, and the other uh, movie stars and crew that came. That was over 500 hotel nights that they spent in St. Louis. Wilmington, Wilmington, North Carolina, Secrets and Lies on ABC, Under the Dome, its second season has just started casting for extras. Atlanta all, is also filming Midnight Rider, the movie about Greg Allman. Detroit, filming Batman and Superman, and they've already filmed the Red Dawn movie. Why are we losing these movies to Detroit? This is the home of Walt Disney. This is also the headquarters of AMC theaters. It's not just, and over the next month or so, I'll be uh, going to Chicago to participate as, to be an extra in the movie, or the TV show, Chicago Fire, Chicago PD. I'm already uh, part of the TV show Crisis which means three of the four NBC TV shows being filmed in Chicago, I've been a part of. Now, it's not just a fact that money isn't coming in, but I'm not the only actor who is actively seeking employment outside of Kansas City. We're leaving town for a while, hopefully not for long periods of time, but we are spending food and lodging and travel expenses in other cities. We would rather see that come here so that we don't have to leave town to look for work. Anyway, thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, Paul.
Okay, Alan Norman. Thank you. Oh. Okay, are you come? Are you going to talk? <laughs> Boy, that's the shortest Alan Norman's ever spoken. <laughs> okay, Margaret May. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for, I'm uh, sorry, I'm Margaret May with the Ivanhoe Neighborhood Council, uh, 3700 Woodland. Um, we are really appreciative to have been included with the CDCs that were recommended for CDBG dollars for our minor home repair program, and we urge your uh, support of that recommendation. Secondly, I wanted to lift up legal aid to you. Um, I've been working in Ivanhoe now going on 13 years, and throughout that time, legal aid has been very, very, very helpful to us. Uh, in many, many ways, um, uh, correcting deeds. Sometimes we can't do work on the properties in the neighborhood with our CDBG dollars because the deeds that the residents have, they, they're living in a house that was owned by their parents. Deeds, you know, haven't been corrected. They've been very helpful to us uh, with that. And uh, another good example um, we were a part of the Go Invest Wisely suit that Legal Aid filed on behalf of the neighborhoods. One of the houses included in that was a house in Ivanhoe that um, had folks living in it. They had a contract for deed that if they had lived there and paid on that deed for 100 years, they never ever would have owned the house. And uh, through getting uh, that house through that suit and being receiver for them, uh, those folks w within the next couple of years will actually be the full owner of the house because Jackson County has helped us uh, with time payments for the taxes and, and all of those things. So it's a very good story. Finally, I just want to say some thank yous, and I know that whenever you try to say thank you, we end up le leaving someone out. So I'll just say that we appreciate all of the city staff, but a special appreciation to the mayor and our third district council reps for all of the support they received for 10 years if, that it resulted in the Aldi store. Uh, that store did open um, earlier this month, and we are just overjoyed with the fact that when you ride past there, most of the time the, the parking lot is full. And then I'm just going to mention some names quickly since I see Travis is telling me my time is about up. Uh, Stuart uh, Bullington and Doug Bossard and the housing staff, Deletta Dean and Vanessa Husky and the folks that work uh, with uh, Deletta, uh, Michael Shaw and Marlene Leonce, and uh, finally Amelia McIntyre and Michael Patillo, and then all the laundry list of staff that help us in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, Joseph Jackson. Morning. Thanks for your service on our school board. Yeah, but today I'm a neighborhood leader. <laughs> Mayor James, members of the city council, first I want to thank you for coming today. As a member of Neighborhood Advisory Council and President of Santa Fe, I want to thank you. We know it's a difficult budget times, but we're all having to work together. And first I want to thank you on behalf of Santa Fe for the investment that you made within Santa Fe, the housing department, the federal loan program, which is going to help about 40 Santa Fe residents get properties fixed within our neighborhoods. Also, the other programs that you're helping with that helping us to revitalize our neighborhoods. But today, I'm also here to talk about the codes program because we have to look at codes. The volunteer inspector program is a major program within codes. It helps neighborhoods that are one to work with the codes department to faster alleviate vacant invited properties within the neighborhoods. And a lot of these properties are not properties that are owned by grandmas and grandfathers in our neighborhoods. They're owned by out-of-state investors who refuse to work within the neighborhoods. In a recent home in Santa Fe that was owned by a company from out of town, bricks fell off the side of the house, trapping the resident's car inside of their driveway for about a week until the city, thank you, came out and removed those bricks. But it was through the VIP program that we were able to identify certain things that, like that. In another case, we had a homeowner who 
the home was being rented for $800 a month, but it had no electrical power. The property owner had supplied the persons with a generator so he could continue receiving his $875 a month, and the residents complained. And it was through the VIP program where I took pictures, reported it, and we were able to get that individual out of that house after about 10 days, which would not have happened without the VIP program. We tried to work with the owner, but he still would not. He was more willing to look at people instead of not his profits. He wanted those first. So I'm here today to advocate on behalf of the CODES program, VIP, but also legal aid, because legal aid takes over where the city ends. And if it was not for the hard work and dedication of their programs, they would, we would not be able to go after the out-of-state owners to be able to get these homes back and to put them into capable people who want to be responsible homeowners. Again, thank you. Thanks, sir. Rodney Sampson. Good morning, fellow budgeteers and former members of KCNAC, who I see are here. Um, today we get to talk about an idea I've got. We're going to save some money, which we all are about. How about trash truck ride-alongs? Neighborhood preservation officers can take one, one day a month or one day a week, ride along with the trash trucks, take their laptops along, take the cameras along. They can be photographing stuff and making notes on the way. There's a vacant seat on all the trash trucks. Um, next one up, I've noticed a lot of police officers that aren't obeying the laws that they're supposed to be enforcing. Left hand turns on 31st Street and Southwest Traffic Way. No left turn zones. 47th and Rock Hill, they're not a bus. A number of other places we've seen. Also turning on their lights and sirens just to get around the intersection to come into the station. Doesn't set a very good example for the people who are out there learning how to drive. And that's what this should be, the shining example. I uh, did notice also that community gardens, most of them around our area, didn't shovel their sidewalks. They need to be made responsible for doing that if they're going to use the property, as well as mowing it. We got a few of those that happen too. We'd also like you to consider plowing the alleys during the emergency conditions that we've got. For instance, the uh, last snowstorm that we had dumped 10, 12 inches on us. Well, some of us actually used the alleys and parked off street by, as requested. Well, we found our alleys impassable because city plows would pile up three feet of snow at the entrance to our alleys, and we couldn't get out. So we have to hire a private contractor to come out and do it. And that's a chunk of change for us. Uh, we also need to make sure that along city properties uh, that they get their sidewalk shoveled. I'm sure that the guys here at the Mohart facility were really busy trying to clear off their one square block worth of sidewalks. And next one, in all these nice hearings about the bicycle lanes and everything else, I'd like to remind everybody that Bicyclists have to obey the laws of the road, and the only one that they can disobey is when they come to an intersection, a controlled intersection, without traffic. They have to stop and wait for all the rest of the traffic. I've seen a number of accidents that are waiting to happen. One guy down at uh, Summit and 25th Street blew through the stop sign. It's a four-way stop. And just about became a statistic. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> Evie, Evie Craig. Evie. 
Sorry, there was a fully grown adult here before me. Uh, good morning, and thank you for this time. I want to thank you for your time and service to Kansas City. And while I cannot say that I follow fully each line item or every table, I can say that I and my colleagues from agencies serving the homeless and my neighbors in Paseo West truly appreciate the complexities and the unbelievable challenges you face with the budget every year. And I'm saddened to inform you that in 2013, Restart saw a 73% increase in the number of people we served from 16,289 in 2012 to 28,133 in 2013. 11,174 were children and youth. And I, well, I applaud the capital investments that the city has made um, over the past several years and know that they are vital and necessary. I look forward to the day when the budget leads with our most important capital, our children, and when we stand together and say we're committed that every zip code will be safe, every zip code will have quality education, and every zip code will provide an environment for those who can't choose which zip code they live in, that is our children and youth. That will be an investment that will not only be for that budget year, but an investment in our future, and I look forward to that day. I just wanted to say that we do thank the city manager and all the city staff, uh, particularly those who are helping us uh, develop uh, and become the catalyst for more partnerships for affordable and accessible housing. Uh, the support that you provided to our outreach team alone helped us reach 21,500, make 21,592 contacts with individuals, get them inside, and helped us make sure that our community's most vulnerable citizens were safe, have been safe during this terrible winter. Through the 100,000 Homes KC campaign, with your support, we have successfully housed 308 chronically homeless persons, including 83 veterans. So thank you for making that possible. Just want to give you a very brief update on our point in time count, because we just did that uh, about three weeks ago. So according to our point in time counts in January of 2012 and 2013, we're waiting for our most recent numbers. But between those two years, the number of both and sheltered single adults and families decreased slightly, uh, so we are making progress. But one number went up, and that is unsheltered youth and young adults. So again, I encourage you next to, look, to continue to look for ways to solve this problem and to help us invest in our most important human capital, our children and youth. So thank you. Thanks, Abby. I was with Restart. I'm Abby Craig, President and CEO of Restart. Kevin McKinney. Morning. Home commission meeting. Am I am I speaking to? Well, the it right? sort of is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, got into the industry here in 1992, and I have to tell you, I knocked on a lot of doors, and a lot of them didn't answer. I'm very thankful for the film commission that we had at that time, because they brought in a lot of people from out of town that gave me experience. And when I had that experience, I could go back to those doors that were not opening for me before. And suddenly I had a skill set that I could bring to the film community here in Kansas City and raise up the bar. Now extrapolate that to today. If, these, if the young people of today, the young entrepreneurs, have this film office, that gives them an asset that they can bring back to their community that they can bring to those mom and pops that open the door for them. Or, and I see this all over the place, they're starting their own communities, their own film uh, companies. And I'm working for those kids now that are, that are getting that experience from the film office. So uh, I, I urge you to support the film office because actually that is what brings business here to Kansas City. And this is something that I mention now because it's hard to measure. But I'm here, and there's, there's, I see a lot of people in this mm -hmm. audience are here just because of the film office. Patty Watkins and her ability to, to bring in a, a director from out of town and say, hey, we have it here, and I can show you. That's worth um, more than you can measure. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> that was the final person who signed up. Was there anyone who... Uh, did not sign up that would like to briefly speak? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Retta Carr. I'm with Art from the Start, and I feel like sometimes people are just sick of hearing from me, but um, I think it's important to um, make a public announcement that artists have an extremely high
high value in uh, what they can offer to construction through design phase and participation. Um, first of all, I'm very excited about all the work that uh, Kansas City is doing and very excited about Mike Burke's um, report and it's very encouraging and very uh, exciting to me and exciting to a lot of people as far as what the possibilities could be. Um, I want to to let it be known that it's important that artists have venues, have opportunities um, in projects like the streetcar um, for, for downtown. Um, you know, it was an afterthought. I didn't know about the project. But as an artist, finding out about the project, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great if we had ports at each trolley stop where you could plug in your iPhone, your iPad, you could charge. You know, what if you were just dead in the water and needed some energy? And then what I figured out was, well, that would cost the city money. It would cost a monthly bill of electricity for charging that. So why don't we use radiant energy? Because that wouldn't cost anything. And then it was the initial cost of building the ports themselves. And then I thought, well, maybe I can come up with the money myself and do it without tax money. And it's creative thinking like that that solves problems time and time and time and time again. So my plea is that the city make this wonderful possibility turn into the biggest reality that it could be. Thank you. Is there anyone else? You, if you want to just go make a line and we can just hear some comments if you are interested. Hi, my name's Bob Stewart and I just moved here a couple years ago from Los Angeles. I'm an actor, I have a company there called Now Casting and we do casting services for the industry. Part of what we do is we do location casting which we provide services for them to be able to record auditions, take those auditions and then send them to everybody that needs to be able to see them. And the trend that I saw when I started this company, we started doing this in 2006. And the trend that we saw is a lot of it was still in, in Los Angeles, but now it's been branching out. And we've noticed that in our business that it's important to have some, someone be able to support the area. Because when something goes to like Atlanta, Atlanta started with a smaller industry, but that industry has grown there and it's become significant. The same thing with uh, Arizona, the same thing with uh, different areas that we've seen. Detroit was one of them. And with the support of the councils, with the support that you guys are offering in these arts line items that you have, that's a great step. It's just a great positive step because if we can establish Kansas City, which has some great architecture, some great fountains, and if we can get that out there and we can get some productions to start coming here, then that will bring more productions and more productions until it's very possible that we could become a hub similar to what you see in Atlanta, similar to what you see in Chicago, and we can draw a lot more industry here, not just in film and television, but film, television, commercials, industrials, webisodes, and we would be able to build the crew that is necessary for these people to come here. We have a good crew base here now, but we could make it even better the more work we have here. So by supporting those three line items that you have supported, you're doing a great job in terms of helping us now, but also laying the groundwork. So as you think about the budget items and things like that, know that I have seen smaller areas been able to grow their, their film, and, film and commercial industries significantly. And that in turn creates a much larger, and it just starts to snowball. So you get a lot more revenues coming in. And let me tell you that there are significant revenues, you all know this, when a production company comes here, they spend a ton of money, and they spend it because they're in triage mode a lot of the time, and they're like, I need something, I need it now, so give it to me. And they don't care what it costs, that's what they're on production for. So there are a lot of things, it's a great thing that you guys are doing, we greatly appreciate it, and thank you. Thanks, Bob. My name is Dave Sullivan. I'm executive director of Arts Tech. We're a youth development agency in the Arts Crossroads District. 
I'm very pleased to be here today to hear what the city, the Film Commission, Harlan, and all the other folks from the Arts KC Fund are going to do for our children. One of my jobs and one of my dreams is to help provide opportunities for our young folks to have the dreams and opportunities in the art and other job fields. You will provide that in the next five to ten years with this commitment and I look forward to working with folks to help our kids realize the dreams that you all are talking about today. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Is there anyone else? I'd like to ask our, oh, go ahead, Alan. I, I knew we got off. I knew you wanted to say more. <laughs> just, just a couple of things I want to share with you. Uh, I was in San Antonio the first part of January, you know, when it was so cold up here. Um, and I was swinging my granddaughter, and next to me was the chief of staff for the mayor of San Antonio, uh, who's now the city attorney down there. And he was telling me about all the nice, wonderful things that were going on in Kansas City. I just thought you all might like to know that, that people around the country are noticing Kansas City and all the good things that are happening and what we're all doing here. Uh, another thing I'd like to draw everybody's attention to the fact that the Missouri Public Service Commission is having a public hearing tomorrow at noon at the public library, Plaza Public Library, about the imp imp possible increase in gas rates. It's important that we show up there. I've been to several of these, and let me tell you people, there'll be a half a dozen people at these hearings, and this is beginning to affect our quality of life in Kansas City. Uh, that leads me to another subject. One of the things I think that we as a city need to look at is that there are a lot of people living here who can't afford to live here. Wonderful city. We got it all, but there are an awful lot of people that are here that really can't afford to live here. Utility rates are a big part of that. And as you look at things, our funding sources like uh, utility taxes and things like that, we need to be very, very sensitive to that because we're at that point to where a lot of people are really hurting because of what it costs them to live in Kansas City. Wonderful as it is. Uh, and thanks all these thanks for all these people here. Great ideas. I hope we can can support them. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Helen. Okay. Thank you. I would like our city staff to stand up so they can be recognized. They are they are listening to you as well. They are we have people from all of the departments. So. They too have heard your uh, concerns and your uh, interest in certain activities. So we'll start down here with Councilman Reed and uh, wrap up and uh, the mayor will give his final comments. So. Well, thank Mr. you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you to everybody who's here today uh, for coming out on a Saturday uh, morning to uh, talk about uh, things that certainly are important, which is our city budget and things that are important to each of you. Uh, if my count is correct, there were at least uh, 12 or 13 people who spoke on behalf of the arts uh, today, but certainly um, you guys are here in numbers and there are a lot more people uh, who are here for the arts uh, than that spoke today. So I want to let you know that certainly we've heard your voices, or at least uh, I've heard your voice and uh, certainly seen uh, your uh, adv advocacy for the arts today. I also want to thank our neighborhood leaders uh, who are here, many uh, third district neighborhood leaders who are here who uh, also probably did not speak as well, but uh, are advocates every day for the neighborhood and for things that are happening here in our city. A big thanks to our city staff, our city manager for uh, their hard work. Uh, I'm sure all of my colleagues will probably say thank you to you guys, uh, but I don't think we can say thanks enough because $1.4 billion of uh, a budget is not very easy when looking at how to place it and doing, um, uh, coming up with all of the concerns that many of us have. And so it's very, very important to say a big thank you to you guys for everything that you, you have done. I will say that um, there were a number of issues that were discussed today in the short period of time that we've been here. Um, and I will say that I, I do have some concerns as it relates to the budget 
uh, as presented in today and next week, uh, which I think is our, our last public hearing for the budget, and then we go into uh, department hearings. Uh, but there are some concerns that I have, and just briefly, as, as we look across the board in each department and looking through the budget, there are cuts uh, across the board for our city budget and uh, uh, cuts in staff positions. Um, if you look in general services, public works, if you look in many of the places in the city budget, there, there are some cuts. And that means that people will po possibly lose their jobs. Uh, that, mean that, that means that uh, some of the services that are provided here in the city uh, won't actually be provided to the level that they've been provided in the past. And so those certainly have uh, some concerns for me. Uh, one of the issues that I believe someone spoke about was codes and enforcements there and the cuts there. Uh, certainly I, I have concerns about those as well. I think that uh, rebuilding our neighborhoods are very, very important, and so it's important that uh, we have staff that, that could fully um, function and actually go and look at the cut, look at the codes that uh, are being viola violated, and also make sure that we uh, target those uh, individuals who are out of town owners at those homes, and so uh, we've got to be able to, to provide funds there. Uh, our Safety net providers, um, I, I think that one of the things that's important, and we as a council have heard many times, uh, just even in this past week, about how violence um, and re reducing violence in this community and, and handguns and, uh, is so important. And so been able to, uh, to do that and, and work uh, effectively to reduce crime and violence in this community is extremely important to me. Um, I don't want to steal all the thunder. I'm sure that uh, Glover will do just that, uh, who's next. Uh, and then many of my colleagues, so I'll save some for them. And uh, again, just a big thank you to all of you for uh, coming today and speaking. And I'll let Councilman Glover steal the rest of the thunder from the colleagues. I, I have no thunder for today. It seems like a nice day. And from this, um, Initial read looks like a, a good budget, but a tough budget it, that where we're losing uh, jobs, like my colleague said. I would note that um, these are listening sessions, and um, instead of taking positions on the budget, I think I, my style in the past has been to um, respond to what I've heard. And um, I've heard a lot about the arts community and the film making uh, capacity. In the past, I supported the, um, the film effort at EDC. I think we housed it at EDC and I opposed it being cut. And that wasn't just because I like the arts, although I do. <laughs> Um, the arts do make money for Kansas City, which provides revenue. And the more revenue we do bring into the city budget, the less cuts we're going to have to make. And although advocacy for the arts, for the arts' sake, because I think there is a good reason to advocate uh, that, um, making us a more vibrant city, a more creative city, a, a more fun city to be in, it needs to be put in dollars and cents that it's part of our economy, it grows our economy, it um, generates revenue to the city budget that, that we can put into other needs into our neighborhoods for code officers which are needed to Restoring vacant houses. Um, bring, we have still 6,000 vacant houses out there. I, I note that the city manager has put an effort into the budget to restore, upping our effort to restore vacant houses. Uh, Mr. Manager, it's not enough, but it's probably all you had. We're going to have to do better. Um, but Again, listening to the comments here today, uh, you were talking about the the, uh, the economic, the financial generating 
effect of arts, of the arts community, how it brings jobs and revenue into the economy, which brings money into our budget, which the city manager can then have more money to put in the budget. So that's not thunder, that's just trying to reflect what I heard. <laughs> and uh, the real thunder may come later when we stop the listening sessions and we talk as colleagues about what we have heard in the listening sessions and what we think may stay or may get better. So with that, I'll... He gets under. <laughs> Yeah, I got thunder. Anyway, um, I'll try to be brief, though. There, there's a few items here that, that I do want to make sure gets out there and at least communicate some of the efforts that we are doing uh, reflective of some of the comments. Uh, first, on the film office, uh, my old friend Larry Garrett, I told when he came up to say hello, I said, just don't sell past the sale. And, and, but we're way past that now. Um, the, uh, but the thing that I do want to say is there, there's a... I don't know if I call it a challenge that I would give to you uh, within the film community. Maybe there's a better way of saying it. But, but one of the things that is obvious to me that is that if what comes from the film office is an incremental increase in film activity, that in my mind is a failure. I believe the expectation should be of exponential growth. Because if there is not exponential growth, then the other issues that were discussed today and those who will advocate for those other issues will say, well, what did it mean at the end of the day? And I think you all understand that. Um, but I, I want to, to make that or, or put that out there because I think there are those who will say, well, we have all of these other issues and all these problems and now you're adding something new. So accept the challenge and let's look for exponential growth. And, and you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this office I, and a big fan of Patty Watkins. Back in the day when I was at City Market in the, in the mid to late 90s, I worked with her and we had a number of things that came to City Market because of her. So I understand um, what you're talking about, but, but please accept that challenge because I think if we make that challenge, then that office will continue for years to come and it won't be a casualty later on. Um, I, I will take a stand on codes, and I've already done it several times in front of this council. We cannot have fewer people, and we get to the summer, and we have what last year was 400 cases per person, and with less people, it's now up to 600. We will never be able to handle codes and those caseloads. We have to preserve positions. Um, my, uh, my chair has been very good about saying if you, if you can find something to cut, we can make some things happen. I've, I've, found, I've made a suggestion and, and, and I hope that it is accepted, although the suggestion is really more of a case of do you want a bad outcome or a worse outcome, but at any rate, saving those positions I think are, is vitally important for our neighborhoods. Um, Bill, you made a very interesting comment on uh, the homesteading authority. I sit on the homesteading authority. I was there when we accepted 400 properties before the establishment of the land bank. And I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm losing my patience as to what are we going to do with these properties we have accepted. You may have a very excellent idea. I'm, I'm hoping that we get even more ideas on what to do with those properties. Because one of the other ways we increase our budget is when we get rid of maintenance costs. And at $150 a clip per summer on mowing alone, um, we have got to do something with those hundreds of properties that we have accepted just within that particular body. Um, the uh, comment on snow and the walking lanes, there is, a, there is an effort underway um, on sidewalk policy in general. Um, one of the things that we are considering is how to deal with snow issues, and that is not only just an issue for those who are, you know, regularly walking through, but frankly, it's an ADA issue for us as well. And so there is that conversation going on. And finally, uh, Evie, um, you warned me that you were coming here today, so I, I'm glad you were here. There you are back there. Um, uh, I know you've advocated very well for, for uh, our homeless population. Um, uh, as you know, we are working on that, and I hope that in the coming uh, weeks we have uh, some things that we'll unveil 
um, uh, that will really move the needle on how we deal with homelessness. So with that, that's all I've got. Thank you all for being here today. It does matter that you've been here today, and uh, we look forward to working with you further. And now, Councilman Ford. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, also, uh, for those interested in the arts community, you should know that Advance Kansas City, which is our, our, our new model for economic development in Kansas City, has recognized arts as a targeted sector. And, and so we do recognize, as Bill pointed out, the link between economic development and the arts. Um, I am concerned about the, the cuts for the safety net providers. Uh, this is the second hearing, second consecutive hearing we heard about the good work legal aid does in the neighborhood program, and hopefully we can find a, a few more dollars for that program. Uh, and then I just wanted to, uh, to respond to the gentleman that talked about why Atlanta has The Walking Dead and Detroit has the Batman movie. We all know that Atlanta has more zombies and... Uh, and Detroit's a lot closer to Gotham City. <laughs> when he gets out of office, if someone could employ him as a stand-up comedian, he'll be very happy. Uh, Travis, put the time up for me, because I think uh, we should show leadership on how short we speak, um, since we expected that out of our citizens. So I'll try to be very quick, um, so that, that you get, the mayor actually gets to talk to a full audience. Um, it's tough to make budgets, it's tough, and this is a tough one, but this is not the toughest that I've been in front of and really most of this council. We went through the very, very lean times from the very first year we came in. We've, every year we've done structure change management to get more efficient, um, to look at our policies and procedures uh, and do more with less, and we've been doing a very good job at that. This year is another cleanup year to address some past issues. Um, uh, and I feel very, very good about Kansas City and it moving forward because at the same time as we've been doing this structural change management and getting a budget that really works, um, we're creating a budget process that works with priorities and then hopefully starting next year through the ballot measure where the citizens really do have a time and place where they have real input um, on their priorities as the, the, the budget is structured. We are setting in a foundation that only allows us to grow from here. So I'm very excited um, that I was a part of that and my colleagues have all been very critical on that. So thank you all. Very quickly, all of those budget cuts are tough, but when we recognize that it is people that really do change neighborhoods, when we create density and people see value in their neighborhoods and create a culture in a neighborhood, no matter how many code enforcers enforcement officers we have, if there's not people that value their neighborhoods, those code enforcement officers can write tickets all day long and nothing's going to change. So it's you. When I asked you when you came for uh, the Casey Arts presentation, you need to show up. You need to show that you value yourself in front of us. That's when things happen, when communities collide together and start taking a stand for what they believe in. So thank you for being here. It is greatly appreciated. So show that same passion to the neighbor you live next door to and to the neighborhood that you live in. There's a lot of things to be concerned about with this budget, but quite frankly, I am very proud of the process. Uh, I'm proud of the process because what we've done with this budget is prove that your leadership uh, is what it should be in a democracy. A leadership in a democracy should first listen, it should be responsive. What happened in the arts with this budget is very reflective of that. If somebody had said to me a couple of years ago, will that be the number one priority for improving things in your budget for this year, I'd say not a chance. But because you came forward, because you w spoke about the need, you've uh, You've made this council listen, made us change our priorities, and we'll be improving that service. I think that's what democracy means, and I'm proud of it. Uh, I'm also uh, concerned that uh, it's a budget that, uh, that, that is going to be difficult in a number of areas. Uh, uh, I'm very concerned about the freeze on position that's occurring. I'm concerned that uh, code enforcement may, in fact, be lessened. I'm concerned about snow removal and weed control may be lessened. We really can't afford that. I'm very concerned about uh, a loss of capability. But overall, I think this is a budget that I can be quite proud of 
again because we listened and we were responsive. Thank you. I'm uh, Scott Taylor, 6th uh, District at large again. Uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming out today. We have a great turnout, very good, positive, specific comments, which are very helpful to us. I just want to thank you for that. I also want to thank all the city staff that's here. I mean, this is a Saturday morning. This shows their dedication. They wanted to hear what you had to say, and, and they're here for that uh, reason. The, uh, the budget is difficult. I won't go repeat everything that's been said, but we all are, are very cognizant of providing basic city services in the most efficient way possible, and I think this budget reflects that. Uh, but there are a couple things I do want to come on, comment on specifically. Uh, legal aid, uh, Margaret May, your comments are uh, you know, right on as far as what we heard last week as well from Greg Lombardi. Uh, where he said basically for $2,300 we save eight or $9,000 out of the city's uh, expenditures. So it, Legal Aid's a great organization, very good with the taxpayers' uh, dollars, efficient. Uh, I, I would hope we could look at uh, making a tweak in the budget there. That's a, a $97,000 change we'll, we'll have to offset somewhere else. Um, on the arts, uh, the other thing I want to mention, as I did last week, that this isn't just a few people coming out saying we want some money for arts. This has been a very strategic plan. I, I want to commend the mayor, the city manager, uh, because had they not started this process with the arts community, we wouldn't be here today with a very specific plan. And I think that's my other point, uh, to point out that we have a very strategic plan developed by the citizens of the city. Hundreds of citizens spent uh, probably thousands of hours developing this plan. Uh, and it's a very good plan if you look through it. It's very strategic. I, a couple things I want to point out. I think the funding is very uh, strategic in the sense that it, uh, uh, it, it says this is what we will do with the money. This is the return on investment. From somebody from the private sector, I really like the fact that uh, for a small investment in the film commission, and I, I want to go back to Heather Laird's comments because it was your uh, article, I think, in the KC Design magazine several months ago when we were talking about this at a uh, council session uh, that caught my attention on this. Uh, the, uh, for a small amount of money, uh, that position will help us, as you mentioned, we lost one film at, uh, that had a 10 to $12 million uh, impact. I mean, it, it's a no-brainer. And so that would be, uh, if that position just secured one or two projects a year, it pays for itself. And, and many times over for uh, local businesses. I think the, uh, the arts uh, expenditures catch my attention in a couple of ways. I think it's really a small business issue. I've been impressed as the uh, chair of the Small Business Committee at all the small businesses we have in the arts industry. And these are, a lot of these are new uh, high-tech startups. Um, I think you've mentioned, Mayor, the, uh, the latest James Bond film. Part of that was done by a, a company here in Kansas City. And, uh, the uh, examples go on, uh, but I've been really impressed with that. So I think this, this supports small businesses, as will all these new projects coming into town, as we've heard. The, the, the larger, or the most important part of this to me, though, is for the, the future of our children in the city. And I, I've seen firsthand uh, the positive impact of, of art. So we have, uh, Kathy and I have a 10-year-old son, uh, Drake, who is uh, involved in all kinds of different activities. He sings, he dance, he acts. He's, he's had the opportunity to be in a few small films. We have a great uh, uh, student filmmaking community in Kansas City that doesn't get enough credit uh, at UMKC and uh, elsewhere. And uh, the, the, uh, the, just from what I've seen firsthand, how uh, getting involved in the arts really does teach a child uh, some discipline. Uh, self-discipline, also drive, and it carries over into schoolwork. And I think that's something you can't really measure in dollars in a budget discussion, but uh, it really does help. Uh, I, I think if we can make more opportunities for our children in all 12 to 13 or 14 school districts within our boundaries, uh, you would see a, 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 a big improvement uh, in academics as well. It, it does tie together. Uh, unfortunately, being a for former school board member, I know arts are the first area that get cut in budget, school budgets, and that's been a, a major problem for years. But I would encourage uh, the arts community that's here today to, uh, uh, if we make this investment, to uh, uh, consider ways that you can, uh, your organizations can get even more involved with the school districts and really b make a public-private partnership uh, where you can as much as possible. It does make a difference for our children, and that's really why I'm supporting uh, the, these expenditures. So thank you.
I'd, I'd like to thank you for coming too. My name is Melba Curls, and I chair uh, the Neighborhoods, Housing, and Healthy Communities uh, Committee. And that committee involves all of you because uh, when we talk about neighborhoods, we need safe neighborhoods, we need animal control. Nobody's mentioned animal controls. If you have animals roaming around your neighborhood, then it's, that's a problem. You call animal control, hopefully they have enough staff to come out, but they don't have a lot of room left at the facility. So uh, things like that, uh, we need to be cognizant of that and to fund enough staff so that they can help our community. We also, uh, has, as has been mentioned, uh, our codes and, and regulated industries. I went, went to a neighborhood meeting uh, last week and a regulated industry staff person was there, but they don't have a lot of staff either to regulate and to go to all these bars, clubs, uh, liquor stores, all of this. That's regulated industry, so we need to uh, be mindful of that. And we say neighborhoods and we say housing. We need, we need safe housing. We need affordable housing. We need uh, housing, if we have a vacant house in our neighborhood, we need it either boarded up or torn down. That's, that's been a really uh, point in third district because we have more vacant lots, more abandoned homes than any of the other districts combined. So, and as far as healthy communities go, I know our um, safety net providers like Truman and Swope and and our health department, we need our staff to be there and because we want to be healthy. And they do, uh, uh, a lot of times they'll serve the public for no charge. Now that's a big deal and they've been doing it for years. So we need to be supportive and try to fund that. And finally, um, we need our uh, communities to be safe for our children and our senior citizens and for all of us. And I applaud you for coming here for, for our, uh, for your, uh, uh, what is it we're wanting? Our acting. Um, I said I'm acting. I don't act, but that's a good tool too because it helps young and and everybody. So we're glad to see you here to share with us your thoughts. And good luck to all of you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for attending. Uh, I'm John Sharps. I mentioned earlier I chair the uh, City Council Public Safety and Emergency Services Committee. And uh, we do want to hear your comments. And then I think you also deserve the right to hear our response and, and how we're feeling, too, because that's how democracy works best. Uh, I certainly share the concern of, of several of my colleagues uh, about the cuts and codes, because no matter how active our neighborhood leadership is, they're, they're are a few people that just don't have the same passion and the same commitment to improving their neighborhoods and improving our community that uh, all of you do and that our neighborhood leaders do. I agree totally that investments in the arts uh, uh, makes a, a lot of sense as an economic development tool. Uh, before I came to this meeting uh, this morning, I went to an open house they had uh, out at 105th, basically I-435 in Holmes, and St. Luke's Health Systems is consolidating their office operations in Kansas City, Missouri, and they'll have about 600 uh, uh, well-paying uh, jobs at that facility, and many of them have moved from, from other outlying areas. That's going to save them a lot of money to have one consolidated uh, location, but of course it, it really helps uh, this city to, to have that uh, here in, in our boundaries just as investments in the arts will do. Uh, last night I had an opportunity to see the premiere of a documentary movie, The Battle of Island Mound, which was the first battle in the Civil War that African American troops uh, fought in, and uh, it was the 2nd Kansas Colored Volunteer Infantry that was very involved uh, in that, routed a much larger rebel force just south of here in Bates County, and, and very few people in, in this metropolitan area even know about that, let alone people around the country. So when we think about films, oftentimes everybody thinks of the big blockbuster movies, but there are a lot of independent movies being shot. There are a lot of documentaries like this. And I, I'm very glad that uh, Mr. Stewart mentioned commercials because we kind of forget about that. But that's a, a 
big market too and also provides an opportunity for economic development. We have talked about uh, how uh, the budget is tight and, and it really is this year, but I do want to let you know, citizens, that I think our staff does a great job in trying to get as much federal funding and state funding uh, for some of our priorities as they can. You know, you may have read in the paper about how the Missouri General Assembly appears uh, dead set on rejecting millions and millions of dollars in federal funding to expand Medicaid coverage so our neighbors that don't have health care coverage could, could have those services and just because of their disagreements with the Affordable Care Act. But here in, in, in Kansas City, we have not taken that approach. And federal funding seems to get a little lower every year. But we have certainly been aggressive in trying to get the federal funding we could get. And just this Thursday, the council unanimously approved accepting a, a justice assistance grant to prevent and deter crime. And that money will go to uh, support the Kansas City No Violence Alliance, which is aimed at uh, reducing violent crime, particularly m murders and aggravated assaults, and it will provide funding for the social services we're offering through that program to people involved in violent criminal networks that really want to seek another path to help them get jobs, to help them get education, to help them go the right way. We're also getting funding through that for the Metropolitan Crime Commission for their second chance program to provide job opportunities for ex-offenders, and we're getting training for our code inspectors to help uh, make our neighborhoods safe and appear safe because I think as all, all of us know, if a neighborhood looks run down, it seems to attract crime. And also training for our animal control officers to uh, do a better job of, of uh, keeping our, our neighborhoods safe from, from the sometimes vicious animals that, that do uh, uh, get loose from time to time. So. When, when we get the opportunities to uh, get that federal funding, we don't say, hey, we don't like this program, you keep your money. We do try to get our share of, of federal money here in Kansas City because we pay those taxes just like they do in California and New York, and we just soon have that money come here as go to those states. Thank you very much. I'll let the mayor go. I will. Uh, I'll be exceptionally. I'll be exceptionally brief. I, I want to thank everybody for coming out and. and he, he, he just another, left. He had another. He had another meeting. He had to go to. Mr. Brooks had to leave. He was here, and he had another. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll be. I'll be very quick. I want to thank everybody for coming out. And uh, uh, if you get a chance uh, as you're uh, driving back to your homes or businesses this afternoon, uh, take a few minutes and drive around what's uh, happening on the east side, whether it be the there's a, a, a tremendous amount of activity, over $200 million of uh, public and private investment occurring east of Troost Avenue in this city right now under construction. Uh, start at Beacon Hill at 24th, you'll see new student housing, you will see half million dollar homes, uh, brand new infrastructure, uh, continue down, it was mentioned, uh, a brand new Aldi's and grocery store to revitalize 39th and Prospect. Lots of great stuff happening in Oak Park, Beacon Hill, Longfellow, Mannheim Park, uh, all through the third district on the east side of this city. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity, there's a tremendous amount of great people uh, there's a great opportunity for more partnerships, and I challenge the artistic community that's present to use this as an opportunity as we make an investment uh, to grow that sector, help us in return by helping the east side and the more uh, historically neglected parts of the city uh, rise again. I, I challenge you to find a better neighborhood in this city than Santa Fe, which is right over off just east of Prospect in terms of the quality of the infrastructure, the quality of the houses, and most importantly, the quality of the people. So never miss an opportunity to show off uh, this city, and we've got a great city, all of it, north, south, east, west, but while you're out here, take a look at the east side. It's at a phenomenal place, and we encourage more activity over here, and uh, the city's going to be in a partner for all of the community for as long as we're around. So thank you very much for your, your time, attention, and passion. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming out today. It's been uh, great to hear from you and to have you participate. Uh, I particularly want to thank the Finance Department of the City 
for the tremendous work that they do in putting this budget together. Um, it is, um, you see the paper, but you don't see the work that goes into every line and every dollar and every number. It is a huge effort done by very outstanding professionals, and they achieve an outstanding result. Unfortunately, they just don't have enough money to work with, and that's one of the issues that we have to address. Um, the reason that the chief of staff of the mayor of San Antonio um, is, uh, was talking about Kansas City is because a lot of places are talking about Kansas City. Uh, it's been an intentional um, act on our part to make that happen. Uh, part of that is as a direct result of the fact that the people up here with me are serving in leadership capacities on local, state, and national organizations. Um, uh, National League of Cities officers and committee members um, MML, Missouri Municipal League committee members, um, U.S. Conference of Mayors, National Black Conference of Mayors, etc. We are getting the word out, and that's what we're supposed to do, because in doing so, we are attracting attention. And as we attract attention, we attract dollars. And as we attract dollars, we attract jobs. And as we attract jobs, we grow this city. So that's what we're doing. I appointed Mike Burke to lead the Arts Task Force for a very specific reason, and that was to get to a point where we knew what we had, could catalog it, and then figure out the best things to do with it. And I love the arts. My wife's an artist, my daughter's an artist. I live in art. But as the mayor of this city, I'm very interested in economic development, and I see the arts as a key part of economic development in this city. It's an asset we have. It can be monetized, and in the process of monetizing, we don't leave the, leave, lose the purity of art. What we do is we increase the exposure of art, and we can and should do that. So the challenge to the arts community, and I appreciate all of you being here, the challenge to the arts community is to find the most cohesive, collaborative, working together way to move all of this forward in a way that makes sense and monetizes it and creates a real, visible, undeniable, unassailable economic engine for this city. We should be leading this country in a lot of ways in artistic and cultural tourism. But that means we've got to collaborate. And it can't just be a collaboration between the arts community in its various sectors and factions. It's got to be a collaboration between the arts community, our convention and tourism people, and everybody else. In short, if we want to have more money to do more things, to hire more code enforcers, to be able to actually plow sidewalks, which it's not really the city's responsibility, that's another issue. But the bottom line is, if we want to be able to do those things, we have to create my favorite thing, that's OPM, other people's money. And that means we got to get them in here to spend it. We have to raise our revenues. Uh, we will continue to support the arts. I don't think there's anybody up here who has any feeling to the contrary. We will hopefully grow our support for the arts, but the arts has to give us a reason to do it. Because I will assure you, as we give more and more to one sector, there's somebody else complaining about it and telling us we ought to be giving more and more to them. So the way that we look at it is very simple, data-based decision-making, what's producing and what's not. So if the more production, the more you get, the more production opportunities. Uh, with regards to snow, we're going to have to ask our citizens to step up a little bit. Uh, they sure don't mind telling us to step it up. Uh, we have stepped it up. We've done a pretty good job uh, increasing our ability to move snow around, much to the uh, credit of the city manager. Uh, our uh, responses from, thank you. We have, uh, uh, our crews work nonstop during snows, uh, clearing 6,300 miles of road, uh, plowing from Boston to San Diego and back uh, every time it snows and the plows come out. And it's not an easy task. So it bothers me a little bit when I hear nonsense like, well, Prairie Village gets its snow plowed in an hour. <laughs> well, yeah, they do. They've got five streets and 15 snow plows. 
bottom line is, is that this city has done a lot of tremendous things in the last few years to increase the service delivery to its citizens. It's innovative with the performance management measures, uh, Casey Stat, Chief in Innovation Officer, the fellows that we have, the involvement that we have in other agencies, manager being involved in core four, the managers and mayors of, jo of uh, Jackson County, uh, Overland Park, Wyandotte County and Kansas City meeting to work on things on a regional basis. All of those things are things that we've been doing now for a few years and they're starting to pay off. But the reason that uh, we are moving forward is because we have not been afraid to innovate. We have a council that is engaged, involved, insightful, and working on uh, making decisions based on data and facts, not emotions and politics. Uh, we have an entrepreneurial spirit. We have an artistic city, and we are about getting things done, and we have gotten a lot of things done, and we have so much more to do. Uh, we do have some issues. Uh, we do need our citizens to step up on snow removal. Landowners, property owners, have the responsibility to clear their sidewalks. Okay, that's the bottom line. If you own a sidewalk, if you're a property owner, clear your sidewalk. Um, in a reasonable period of time. Because we can't do it. City cannot clear everybody's sidewalk, and it's crazy to think that we can. We have enough trouble with 63 miles, 6,300 miles of street. Um, and also that's by ordinance. Um, the, uh, uh, the things that were going on in this city that impact the budget this year, pension, we have wrestled with pension since I've been elected and we finally have them under control. Now the problem with that is, is that that requires a payment, uh, some payments that bring things in line in exchange for taking off $680 million of unfunded contingent liabilities. Those two things have impressed our rating agencies. Councilwoman Mayor Pro Tem Serco uh, had the fun of going to see our rating agencies and talking about the city, and I think she came away impressed with how impressed they were with us, uh, which is a good thing. We are making strides and we are gaining a position on the national stage. The pension issues were absolutely vital to the long-term sustainable financial health of this city. They are tough. They have driven some cities into bankruptcy. They have driven other cities close to bankruptcy. They have driven some cities to cut police departments by half or two-thirds. We have done none of that, and the reason we've done none of that is to a large extent uh, the, uh, to the credit of the finance department, the city manager, and people on this council and me working with the people in our labor organizations in this city to reach reasonable, fun fundamentally sound approaches to handling something that's very important to them and to this city, and that's taking care of its workers. <clears throat> The last thing I'll say is this. We have a number of challenges coming up in this year. 2014 will be a pivotal year for this city. Uh, we, have, we will have a serious discussion about the airport. We will have a serious discussion about transit, particularly streetcar. We will have a serious discussion about crime. We are having discussions about education. Those four things are absolutely critical to the foundation of this city. What we do this year, and I am not overemphasizing this, the decisions that we make as a community about what to do with our 40-year-old pre-9-11 airport and how to address that between absolutely nothing and absolutely everything will determine what that airport is like for the next 40 years. The decisions that we make this year regarding the expansion of streetcar will have a 40-year, 50-year impact on what we do in transit in this city. And if you have any doubt about that, remember about 20 years ago 
when we had the opportunity to lay rails in this city, it was shot down, and now we're here again trying to do something we could have done 20 years ago. <clears throat> and the reason that's important is because just with the downtown starter line, we are at three quarters of a billion dollars and counting three quarters of a billion dollars of new economic development or renovations. I just heard of another hotel going in down in some place in the, in the area I'm not supposed to be talking about. But. <laughs> so we'll move on. The conversations that we have as a community about education and crime are absolutely critical, particularly education. We must address the issues of the perception of the education in KCPS and the reality, and the perception does not match the reality. The perception is that it's rotten stem the core. The reality is that there are some very good, well-performing, high-performing schools in KCPS with good students in all the schools across. However, however, there is enough reality to the fact that we have been undereducating kids in this community for decades that we should all be outraged and be in on our hind legs standing up, making sure that it changes. My older colleagues on the council tell me that the budget meetings that we're having this year are significantly different than the ones they had earlier, and I'd like to think that has something to do with our approach. But I really think it has something to do with the fact that I think the people of this city actually see what this group of people up here are trying to do to move this city forward and to make it the best, and that they understand and they're willing to work with us. So I'm just going to ask you, work with us some more. We have serious challenges coming up. We have to be serious about addressing those challenges. But above all, above all, we have to address those challenges in a way that is best for the entirety of Kansas City. Because we will not stand separated. We can only stand when we are collaborating, working together, and recognizing that Kansas City is the best when it is working together. And right now, we're working together. Thank you for being here, and thank you for working with us. Thank you. We, we have one more uh, budget hearing next Saturday at, from 10 to 12 at the South Patrol Station, uh, Police Patrol Station at, what, 97th and? It's just south of the uh, Home Depot on the south side of Bannister Road. So uh, those of you who want to come again, that's fine. Or well, new, new folks, new ideas, uh, we'd be glad to hear from you. So thank you very much for coming, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.